So one of the sort of themes or main ideas of uh, Shawshank Redemption that we can talk about is this idea of institutionalization. And in the film, it's really uh, nicely dramatized in the character of Brooks Hatlin, who is the sort of uh, oldest inmate at Shawshank, and he spent 50 years uh, in prison. And then he is finally released after spending 50 years and then he doesn't want to leave because uh, he has sort of made a life for himself uh, and been spent his whole life in prison and then now they release him and he's not able to adjust or adapt to life outside and he is somewhat of a tragic character because uh, his whole life has been sort of taken away from him. The prison has sort of stripped him of any sense of self outside of the prison itself, unlike Andy. So a character like Brooks uh, is a sort of contrast to Andy who is always able to sort of maintain a sense of his own self-worth and a sense of freedom uh, outside of the prison itself. Uh, Hatlin suffers uh, the tragic fate of being uh, having internalized and uh, become institutionalized from his experience of incarceration. So in the novella, uh, Brooks Hatlin's character is, it's really just shortly touched on, uh, 40, page 49. Um, Andy will eventually take over Brooks's job as the uh, prison librarian, uh, but it just describes Brooks Hatlin's uh, character so in 1952, Brooksy, who had killed his wife and daughter after a losing streak at, at poker back when Coolidge was president, was paroled. As usual, the state in all its wisdom had let him go long after any chance he might have had to become a useful part of society was gone. He was 68 and arthritic when he tottered out of the main gate in his Polish suit and his French shoes, his parole papers in one hand and a greyhound bus ticket in the other. He was crying when he left. Shawshank was his world. What lays beyond its walls was as terrible to Brooks as the Western Seas had been to su superstitious 15th century sailors. In prison, Brooksy had been a person of some importance. He was li a librarian, an educated man. If he went to the Kittery Library and asked for a job, they wouldn't even have given him a, a library card. I heard he died in a home for indignant old folks up near Freeport Way in 1953, and at last he lasted about six months longer than I thought he would. Yeah, I guess the state got its own back on Brooksy, all right. They trained him to like it inside the shithouse, and then they threw him out. So in that instance, Brooks Hatlin is released, but they've taken away, they've stripped him of any sense of freedom or uh, purpose, and they're not preparing you for the outside world, so he is left... Uh, with a sort of tragic circumstance, he's last he he lasts a a year outside of prison because it just uh, he's not prepared or able to adapt to the world outside. Then there's also the character of uh, Sherwood Bolton, which occurs on page twenty six, and this is just a paragraph that's mentioned in uh, the novella. But uh, both of these characters are sort of combined together in the film version as Brooks Hatlin. Sherwood Bolton is mentioned in the text, and he is the guy who has the pigeon in his cell. Um, and this is Red talking about um, uh, how the prison takes away your whole life. So they say, so he says, uh, they give you life, and that's what, the, and that's what they take. All of it that counts anyway. Maybe they set you loose some day, but well, listen, I knew this guy Sherwood Bolton. His name was and he had this pigeon in his cell from 1945 until 1953 when they let him out. He had that pigeon. He just had this pigeon. Jake, he called him. He set Jake free a day before he, Sherwood that is, was to walk, and Jake flew away just as pretty as you could want. But about a week after Sherwood Bolton left our happy little family, a friend of mine called over to the west corner of the exercise yard where Sherwood used to hang out. A bird was lying there like a very small pile of dirty bed linen. It looked starved. My friend said, isn't that Jake Red? It was. The pigeon was just as dead as a turd. So we have two examples of uh, this idea of institutionalization 
uh, where both men spent the best part of their years, their whole adult life pretty much, behind bars, and the prison has not done anything to sort of rehabilitate them or prepare them for life outside the prison. Uh, it's just broken down their spirit and uh, maybe they had a sense of importance within the prison itself but outside they have no sort of skills in which they are able to sort of adapt to uh, life outside again. And like that pigeon which is sort of a symbol of uh, the sort of broken spirit of the men who are released. Uh, it starves, it's not able to sort of support itself and eventually it just dies because it's been sort of uh, institutionalized itself. So it's been so domesticated or so um, tamed that it is uh, no longer able to exist on its own. So I asked, I linked to uh, an essay by Daniel Ko uh, Wisey uh, called Prisoners versus the Institution, Resistance in the Shawshank Redemption. And this is just an example of a critical reading of the text. Um, you can find, again, if through the library database, look for journal articles, and these can again help support uh, any essays that you do. So you can cite an author and talk about what they said about the book. So this is where you're using research to back up your opinion. So um, in your upcoming essay, if you wanted to use uh, YZ's article, uh, you can again uh, quote, add direct quotations to your essay and cite the um, any sort of article that you read or any research that you do online. Uh, make sure you are sort of giving credit to the author. But uh, in this article, uh, YZ is talking about this uh, phenomenon of institutionalization and how the men um, try to resist uh, and Andy in particular has a way of sort of uh, undermining or challenging this idea of uh, complete institutionalization and he does so uh, by uh, remembering and trying to hold on to his freedom in any way that he can so in the article, uh, YZ sort of talks about uh, institutionalization as a kind of um, mental construct or idea, internalized uh, idea, where the prisoners, long-term prisoners, sort of um, start to think of themselves as just prisoners, right? They're no longer men or humans. They're a prisoner, and that's the whole sense or focus of their identity. And the prison does this by sort of creating uh, a very strict routine or lifestyle within the environment. And that power structure has a lot to do with it. So the guards, the warden, everyone reaffirms this idea that you're no longer a free man. You are, you belong to us now. You're mine. You're my property. And uh, you're nothing but a prisoner. Um, and prisoners are worthless people. So that's sort of the message that uh, is being sent to the men who are part of this environment. So any identity that they had on the outside world, whether they had uh, were intelligent or hardworking or uh, you know just a troubled young man, uh, any potential that they had as a human being is sort of tossed away once they are become a prisoner, and it's replaced by this prisoner. Uh, identity where they are sort of seen as useless or uh, the scum of the earth and the guards and the warden and everyone just views them as sort of a problem that they have to sort of uh, control. So even uh, within this environment which is very oppressive, this penal system, um, YZ talks about there's sort of opportunities or loopholes that exist within this environment that allow the prisoners to find some uh, measure of holding on to the self or their integrity or the identity that they used to have. Uh, so Red has his sort of uh, contraband business so he has sort of a way to maintain ties to the outside world a little bit um, in sort of his black market business. 
in the film, Andy has sort of multiple scenes where he uh, is shown to sort of challenge the oppressive environment. Um, he does so in that scene. He just watched the rooftop scene where he find or negotiates for beers for the inmates and watches the men as they enjoy the sunshine in that scene, uh, the outdoors and the beer. So all those things that remind them of their freedom. He'll also uh, play a record uh, in the film that's included in the novel. It's not, but he, he'll play um, a record and uh, put it over the intercom system so all of the prisoners can listen to this music. So there'll be uh, moments like this where that very oppressive, rigid institution of the prison is undermined by individual inmates, uh, especially Andy, who seems more than the others to be able to sort of hold on to a sense of his freedom. And Red actually uh, describes Andy as having on an invisible coat that would shield him from Shawshank as if he were immune to and independent of the institution. So he has on this um, invisible coat that uh, sort of protects him and allows him to sort of maintain uh, his inner light, his inner strength, whatever you want to call that, his sense of freedom, and not be sort of broken down by the system of oppression. So while the warden and the guards and the prison system as a whole can sort of constrain and control the individual inmates, their behaviors on the inside, uh, so it puts them in cells and it tries to sort of control uh, their daily lives through uh, strict routines and um, the established uh, power structure. Uh, Andy starts to um, Andy sort of is able to undermine some of that uh, power inequality through his intelligence. Uh, we saw that in the rooftop scene where he is the one who gives advice to Hadley and he uh, uses his intelligence to gain power and reputation within uh, Shawshank Institute. And within himself he also has sort of these dreams or ideas and goals for himself that suggests that even though the prison can sort of control and punish him, uh, they can give him solitary confinement, they can't really break his, in, his sort of inner spirit. So his thoughts are his, still his feelings inside, and his attitude is never sort of broken. So they can control you physically, but uh, whether or not they can sort of mentally destroy you uh, is where Andy's character really has uh, inner strength. So um, he is able to sort of resist oppression by imagining and having dreams of a life outside of the prison. So this institutionalization, this occurs both in terms of the physical constraints that an in inmate is put through, uh, but it's also a mental kind of incarceration that is being uh, illustrated in this book where uh, men like Brooks Hatlin have internalized uh, the idea that they're just a prisoner, that's all they can ever be. Um, there's no life beyond the prison walls. Uh, and eventually Red will also sort of identify himself as an institutionalized man um, where he sees, he sort of starts believing that he can't exist on the outside uh, and he believes that he will never be um, able to readjust if he does ever get uh, his freedom. And then Andy seems to be, he never really belongs in the prison, right? He's always somebody who uh, exists as if he were just living his life uh, and maintains his freedom of thought uh, within the prison walls. So. I think it's that fr freedom of thought that Andy's character most um, sort of embodies uh, in the text.